input multiple output systems, the Nanquist criteria will become a little bit different. So let me start with this general block diagram for multiple input, multiple output systems, where uh, this vector, these signals R, E, and Y, they are both vectors. So I'm assuming in this case, Y is M dimensional and R is also M dimensional. So this is a, E becomes also M dimensional. So G open will be a M by N transfer function matrix. Suppose the state space realization of this uh, G open looks like this, a standard continuous time state space system. A, B, C are the matrices, state space matrices, okay? Then you can very quickly derive the closed loop dynamics from this one. So you see uh, E equals to R minus Y in this case. Put this equation inside here. You're gonna get X dot equals AX plus B R minus Y and Y equals uh, C X. And you put Y equals C X in the, into this equation, you're gonna get X dot equals A minus B C X plus B R. So this is the closed loop uh, state space matrices I have written down here. So this is a closed loop uh, state space equations. Now you, you know it very well. To analyze the stability of this system, we just need to check the eigenvalues of this new matrix here, A minus BC. So the eigenvalues is gonna be defined by, the eigenvalues is gonna be defined by this. Determinant of SI minus this matrix. So it's gonna be SI minus A plus BC. We're gonna use a very common trick which you have seen already, so I won't elaborate. So we can uh, take out this part, SI minus A, on the left hand side, and the inside to, to, make the, to make this guy to remain BC, I have to multiply SI minus A inverse here. So this guy will become this guy. And the reason for this uh, very common trick is that now I can separate these two determinants, this determinant and this determinant. So the product of these two determinants gives us a very important information because determinant of SI minus A, as you see, is the open loop, is defining the open loop uh, eigenvalues of the A matrix. And this guy, you see, it looks so familiar because it's I plus G open is the, uh, is, is the guy, if you remember, what's the sensitivity function looks like is this guy, I plus G open S inverse. And in the CISO case, you see it's one plus uh, G open over here. So you immediately see uh, the closer poles can come from over here. Take the determinant of this guy. Now, just divide, simply divide this uh, phi closed by this phi open. You can get this equality here. This equality is actually very useful. And it's connected to the Nanquist plot, which I'm gonna discuss now. So look at this one. Determinant, the determinant of a matrix is nothing but uh, a polynomial of S over here. So I can write it down, uh, not polynomial, a rational function of S. So I can, I can uh, imagine, not, I can assume the close to poles are defined by this way, PCL, P-O-L, okay? So this is phi closed. The top part is phi closed, and the bottom part is phi open. Now, imagine you are to evaluate this determinant along this D contour. So this is a generalized version of the size of Nanquist plot. Uh, evaluate this on the D contour. Well, this R is very, very large. Now, what will be if this, if this is, if let's say, if one of the PCL is here, I will put 
I'll use a circle. So if, if one of the PCL here, if I evaluate this determinant onto this, on this contour, starting from this location, and then I go all the way, coming back here, what will be the negative phase change of this uh, determinant term? Negative phase change. Contribution, uh, considering the contribution of only PCL here. So I'm gonna have, yeah, starting from, at the beginning is, neg is, one, is uh, negative 180 degree, and then go, go, go all the way around to here, and then come back. So it's 360, it's, it's two pi actually here. Two pi times this, so it's, it's the entire circling around here. Now, what will be if PCL is here? If I just have one, if I have another pole, coastal pole over here, what will be the negative phase change? Zero, right? Now, this is the top part. Uh, this is the contribution to, to the uh, closed loop here, the closed loop eigenvalues. Now you have seen, for unstable eigenvalues on the right hand side of this uh, complex plane, it will introduce two pi times the number of uh, unstable eigenvalues, okay? So that's the first part. Now you see uh, the last part. Stable eigenvalues on the left hand side of this S plane will not contribute to any phase change in this evaluation for D contour, okay? Now, if you get that, what about if I have, if you now consider, uh, oh, oh, yeah. if I consider the denominator here, what will be the contribution if I have one denominator, P-O-L, denominator, roots of the denominator over here? It's gonna be, uh, what degree? You have to do, you have to uh, pay attention to one thing, one small thing, minus two pi. So, because this occurs here, right? So, in the, in the same logic, if this is here, then it will not contribute to any phase change. So, open loop, unstable eigenvalues on this right-hand side will contribute to negative two pi times the number of uh, unstable eigenvalues, the, fa the, the net phase change. Over here, for, uh, when I say unstable, I just means on the right-hand side of this S plane. So this is the continuous time case. What will be, for the discrete time case, what will it do? So you have to do it on the unit circle kind of uh, thing, okay? Another thing I want to mention is, uh, is this. So sometimes, uh, this is some additional just uh, terminology. So sometimes for matrices A, whose eigenvalues are all, so this is eigenvalue, all of the eigenvalues are on the left half complex plane, on the left half complex plane. People will call, uh, people has a name for it. And for this, uh, let, me, let me write it on left half plane. And for the group of uh, A matrix whose eigenvalues are inside the unit circle, there's another name for it. So this one is called SCUR, S-C-S, SCUR, if you haven't seen it before.
uh, I will I will kind of abuse the notations. I will call these matrices Scorer or Horowitz, just as stable matrices. This is not the mathematically correct notation. If you uh, want to use the correct notation, it should be Horowitz or Scorer. Okay. So here, actually, I meant uh, it's the same logic. When I say stable eigenvalues or unstable eigenvalues, it means on the left half plane or on the right half plane. Just uh, to explain to you why I had not uh, not actually put rigorous notation here. So now you see what will be the desired situation. The desired situation will be that we don't want any close to poles to be on the right half plane. We don't want any of these to happen. So that means we want this close to unstable eigenvalues, this z, to be zero. That's the desired uh, case. So if you see here, the number of clockwise, so clockwise, pay special attention to this is clockwise, encirclement of the origin by this uh, determinant if I evaluate on the d contour, it's gonna be uh, From here, it's actually going to be negative z minus p, and then it equals p. Because z, if I consider clockwise, it's going to be uh, in this direction. In this direction. I said counterclockwise. So, excuse me for the confusion here. I started one, I had wanted to uh, analyze the clockwise encirclements, uh, but later I found out it's counterclockwise. So let's, let's uh, forget about counter first. What will be the clockwise encirclement of the origin by this? It's gonna be uh, z minus p, because the z unstable closed loop eigenvalues will contribute to 2 pi times d, the negative phase change. And this one, this uh, unstable open loop eigenvalues will contribute to uh, negative 2 pi times p. So this is the, the overall net phase change. It's going to be 2 pi z minus p. So that's the clockwise. That will be the clockwise encirclement of this origin. Now, if I said counterclockwise, I have to do minus this. So in the end, I'm going to do minus z minus p, so which equals p minus z here. So counterclockwise, okay? So I don't want any stable, close to unstable uh, eigenvalues. I want z to be zero. And this will give us the uh, multivariable Nanquist stability criteria. So the closed loop system is gonna be stable, asymptotically stable, if and only if z equals to zero in this equation. So it's this one, okay? <clears throat> so this means the number of counterclockwise encirclements of the origin, pay, pay attention to, is uh, encirclements of the origin has to be equal to the open loop unstable eigenvalues, okay? This is the origin. Uh, in the single input, single output case, you see encirclements of the negative one point, which we commonly use. Okay, so that's the only difference. If I wanna, now in this case, if I wanna evaluate some kind of open loop uh, stability using Nanquist, Nanquist criteria. So what we actually do is this one. So this is the determinant of uh, I plus G open J omega. And we consider the encirclement uh, of the origin instead of the negative one point. In comparison, 
for single input, single output cases. Uh, because we don't, we don't have this, uh, the, the determinant of single input, single output system equals itself. So we can do this. So this is a difference for between MIMO and CISO. Now similarly, we have analyzed for CISO systems when there are perturb perturbations to this uh, nominal, nominal Nanquist plot. What will be the case for the multiple input, multiple output? If I have perturbations to here, what will be the situation uh, for this case? So that's the topic on this slide. The robust stability condition for multiple input, multiple output system. Okay, so the, the setup is, is roughly the same. I have now the uh, perturbed open loop uh, frequency response expressed in this, in this uh, G open times I plus delta, okay? So it's very important to, to state some uh, assumptions for this uncertainty. We cannot, if the uncertainty is arbitrary, like we will just arbitrarily perturb the system, then it doesn't make much sense to talk about stability because the uncertainty is so strong, we won't even be able to stabilize the system. So it's very important to start by recognizing that we will assume the uncertainty had certain bounds. So this bounds here, in the MIMO case, we will use the singular value. So uh, in a, sometimes in a, in a MIMO case, in some other references, people will prefer using the infinity norm. Okay, so for my systems, the infinity norm is the singular value of the frequency response of the transfer function. Okay, so we will say the uncertainty is not arbitrary, it has certain bounds. Now within these bounds, what will be the stability, what will be the requirements such that this perturbed closed loop system is stable, okay? And we will be arriving exactly some results as I wrote down uh, on the blackboard over there, on the bottom of the right half, uh, right half side, right side, right hand side of this uh, blackboard. We'll be arriving something very similar to single input, single output case, but uh, there will be some difference. Okay, so I have mentioned this plot. So for the MIMO, MIMO case, we have to uh, consider determinant of I, now this is plus G tilde open. <coughs> if this is the uncertainty, if this is the perturbed uh, Nanquist plot, we'll have to assure that this Nanquist plot doesn't touch this origin point, no matter how the uncertainty will behave like, okay? So obviously, I need this one, this nominal, this solid line here, this nominal system has to be stable to start with. Otherwise, uh, if the nominal case, the system is unstable, we won't, don't bother to consider the perturbed version. So that's the first one we need to assure. That means the encirclement around the origin for this guy has to be equal to the open loop unstable uh, eigenvalues of the A matrix. Now, for robust stability, I have just uh, uh, expressed uh, the general idea. Now you see, we have to assure this encirclement for this perturbed system around the origin also has to be equal to P for all possible values of delta, okay? So now using this picture, you have seen that this is equivalent to no matter how I perturb the system, I will never arrive at this situation. I will never arrive at, this is the bad situation. I will never arrive at this, uh, the uncertainty will never be sufficient to cover this one, uh, this zero origin point, okay? So this is saying this determinant, determinant, this part, will never be zero because this area, this shaded area, 
will never touch this zero point. Okay? So over here, I have paid special attention to here. I'm saying for any frequency and any perturbation, I won't be able to do this. Otherwise, it will touch this zero point, this origin point, and the system becomes uh, unstable. Okay? So that's the key result here. The remaining part of today's lecture is just going to be some simplification of this term. All right, so make sure you get this equation here. All right. So the detailed modification to arrive at a better, at a nicer conclusion is this. It's something very similar to the trick we have done uh, a moment, a few minutes ago. So take out one uh, part over here, I plus G open, and then separate this determinant into two parts. So I take out this, I have to multiply back the inverse of it over here. So to reach this equivalence. Okay? So look at this equation. Can someone tell me? Will this guy possibly be zero? What's the reason for that? Yeah, exactly. So now, recall, we have considered this nominal Nanquist plot. OK? So it's, in, it's never possible for this determinant to be zero, because this determinant, if you evaluate it, it's just going to look like this. Okay, so it's never zero. Because the the fact, because of this fact, I can divide both sides by this determinant. So I can do because it's on zero. So I can divide I can divide this thing by this guy to obtain uh, to obtain here. Yeah, I have to look at from here to here. Okay, so here we have we have already seen the left hand side cannot be zero because that's the requirement for robust stability, and we have seen this guy cannot be zero. So I can divide this to here. So the conclusion is that this term cannot be zero. This term, this term here cannot be zero. Okay. Now look at this term very carefully. You see, the first part, i plus g inverse times g, this is exactly the complementary sensitivity function. Complementary sensitivity function. So I have reached determinant of i plus t times delta does not equal to zero. Okay, so an intuitive message out of this is that so let me rewrite it: i plus t j omega delta j omega e doesn't equal to zero. So intuitively, it means this guy. This is the intuition has to be sort of smaller than identity in the mag that the magnitude of this guy has to be smaller than identity so a, a rough very rough picture this is uh, just for intuition only is that uh, i plus let's say this so for intuition only so intuitively this means uh, this guy has somehow be smaller than this, uh, I, I said one here, but it actually should be identity in the high dimensional case. So it, it just intuition means this guy will not touch this one point. So in this case, no matter how I evaluate, so I plus this guy, it, it's simply the vector between this and this. So intuitively, it means, it means uh, this vector, this vector will always be non-zero. 
That's the intuition. Recall the single input, single output case. Size of case. We have this. T, J, omega, delta, J, omega, smaller than one. All right? I have reviewed it. Oh, so for the size of case, it means this guy is smaller than one in the absolute value. So in the, size, in the multiple input, multiple case, the idea, the intuition is the same. But uh, we have to be very careful about what does smaller than mean here. Okay, that's exactly when the singular value uh, result will occur. Okay, so mathematically, the result. I better rewrite it again. So mathematically, this guy determinant of i plus t j omega delta j omega. So this is a desired situation. Under what condition will this be violated? It will be, so the determinant of a matrix is the product of its eigenvalues. So this condition will be violated if one of the eigenvalues of this matrix is zero, okay? So that simply means this. So, okay, there exist some eigenvectors such that i plus this times this eigenvector equals the full expression should be zero times x equals to zero. So one of the eigenvalues is at origin. Okay. Everyone has any, anyone, any questions for this part? So this is, you, you have to understand this equation to be able to reach the singular value result. So make sure you get it. Okay, so this is equivalent to this. So I can shift uh, the identity times x on the right hand side to uh, get a negative x over here. Okay, so I can, from here, if this, if this ever happens, we can arrive at this singular value result. The maximum single value of this matrix is going to be larger than or equal to one. If this ever happens, then we can make sure, we can, we can conclude that the maximum singular value of this matrix is gonna be larger than one, larger than or equal to one for sure, okay? So uh, let me, let's take a look at the details here. Now uh, you know, some, some review, a very short review. The singular value of a matrix uh, M equals to the eigenvalue if for the real case. The single value is the square root of the eigenvalue of uh, M times M transpose, okay? This is a review. Also, the maximum singular value of a matrix is gonna be equal to maximum of T, uh, I'm using M. So M times V two norm, V two norm, and then, so it's the maximum of the induced two norm, okay? So if my input is V, output is MV, so the singular value is gonna be the induced norm, two two, or two norm of this uh, linear operation, and take the maximum of it. It's not, because I'm taking, I'm considering all the possible we take the maximum, yeah, okay? So immediately you see, if I consider all the possible we here, then x is definitely one of them. So is this guy is gonna be always be larger than or equal to uh, take a special case of x over here, okay? So if you do this computation here, the two norm of the uh, top part is gonna be exactly equal to the two norm of the bottom part because of this equality here. Okay? So, we have now 
reached the conclusion that uh, if the single value happens in this way, if the maximum single value is larger than or equal to one, then uh, this condition will be violated. This robust stability condition will be violated. So uh, to make this, this, to assure this does not happen, we have this condition here. The maximum single value has to be smaller than one. Again, if I, if you recall what I used at the beginning a few slides earlier, this is equivalent to saying the infinity norm has to be smaller than one. So this is equivalent statement. Okay, so I wrote this down because it looks now immediately, you're gonna be immediately familiar with the result because for the, ingo, for the single input, single output case is T, J, omega, delta J, omega, absolute value less than, equal, less than one for the size of case. Okay, so the result, the structure of the result are exactly the same. It's just uh, now you are taking the maximum singular value instead of uh, the absolute value. Okay. So it turns out uh, this is both necessary and sufficient condition. If this uh, uncertainty term is unstructured, by unstructured it means I, I meant that this uncertainty term can attack from any directions. So a little bit more details. So we won't dig into the details of this part. Uh, here, unstructured means, just means for consider a four by four, a two by two case. It just means each element of this matrix can be, can take whatever values, as long as the uh, original maximum singular value is uh, bounded, okay? So in, in, if you take more advanced, uh, if you read more advanced books about MIMO stability analysis, there are cases like, for example, this uncertainty term, only two elements are uncertain, the other two are zero. So for that, for this case, it's not unstructured. It has certain structures in this uncertainty. Okay, so now you know what does unstructured mean from this, uh, very quick, very big picture of robust stability analysis for MIMO systems. Okay, so summarizing, we have now uh, discussed the linear system, lin uh, size of case of loop shaping. Well, you have, uh, you have seen how this, as a summary, how this open loop open loop frequency response should look like. So this is the big picture of this open loop, uh, size, of, size of loop shape in the, si uh, in, the, in the sense of open loop frequency response. So the magnitude of this guy has to be larger than certain bound if you have, want to have performance in this region. And it has to be smaller than certain bound if you want to have robust stability against the system uncertainties, okay? So we have also talked about uh, single input, single output Nanquist plot and the multiple input, multiple output Nanquist plot. And the only difference, the only uh, attention you have to pay to is for the multiple input, multiple output case, we are considering the encirclement around the origin. And this is the determinant of I plus G. While in the single input, single output case, we are considering the encirclement of the negative one point. Well, this is G open, okay? So that's the roughly the pictures, big pictures for this analysis. And this multiple input, multiple output analysis will be very useful uh, when we started, when we start analyzing LT frequency shape uh, LQ problem, which is gonna be in about Roughly two weeks. Okay, so I want to shift gears to discuss something very practical, but something very important. You may, uh, think about it. When we discussed the multiple input, multiple output system analysis, we start. We talked about the continuous time case. Okay, uh, the discrete time case can be equivalently obtained, but it is absolutely very true 
that in many practical cases, we usually design in the continuous time domain first. And then we discretize it when we implement it uh, in a digital signal processor or FPGA. Okay? So I want to talk about in this lecture about how this discretization is carried out and then what, what kind of constraints we have to uh, keep in mind when we do that kind of discretization. Okay, so I have talked about uh, these general ideas. Controllers are always, nowadays, many of the controllers, most of the controllers are implemented in discrete time domain on a digital signal processor or on a FPGA. FPGA means a field programmable, field programmable gate array. Okay, there are many other implementation medias, but these are all in discrete time domain. So either you design the controller in continuous time domain and implement it digitally. This is the topic for today. Or controller is designed directly in discrete time domain. We will talk about this uh, later in this course, later this semester. Okay. So let's see how we can discretize a continuous time plan. So to make to understand that, uh, I have to do a short review of frequency response for discrete time systems, digital systems. So suppose this is the transfer function, a linear time invariant transfer function uh, G of Z for a system. You know, uh, for discrete time system, if the input to the system is a sinusoidal si signal, then the output will also be a sinusoidal at the steady state. And over there, you know the gain, for example, the gain, the magnitude difference between the input and the output is going to be uh, the gain of the system at this particular frequency, omega. And the phase difference is going to be the phase uh, of the system. So these two will give us the body plot for discrete time system. So here, I'm assuming the sampling time is Ts, T sub s. Okay? Then the frequency response, the discrete time frequency response is uh, in this equation. Okay? It's very, very similar to the continuous time equation, except that in the continuous time frequency response, I use, we use j omega here. And then here, we use e to the power of j omega times Ts. Okay? So this is evaluating the transfer function with z equal to ej omega ts, ts, typo, ts here, okay? So by using the complex uh, notation, we can write this g, big G, of ej omega ts as the magnitude times e times j of its angle, okay? This is exactly, the first part is exactly the magnitude, m, and this guy is exactly the phase. So it's uh, completely analogous to continuous time frequency response. Okay? So I have mentioned to, for the discretization, uh, the measurements and the measurements of the system are all carried out in discrete time domain. So that means for continuous signal, we can only get samples of the signal at different times. All right? There's a very, very fundamental result we have to bear in mind when we do this sampling here. Okay? So it says this. Suppose the signal is exactly a sinusoidal signal. Then you have to, you have to sample enough. You have to take enough samples you have to sample, in another way, you have to sample fast enough, fast enough, fast enough to be able to recognize it is a sinusoidal signal at this particular frequency. Because, for example, here, if you just take these samples, these samples look like this. Even if you know it's, com it's actually a perfect sinusoidal signal, you won't be able to tell whether it comes from this red solid line or this dashed line over here. You cannot tell, okay? The fundamental theorem here, it, the Shannon's sampling theorem says, it, it explains exactly how many samples I should collect 
to make sure I can recover this sinusoidal signal perfectly. Okay, so some definitions. First of all, the sampling frequency is defined by 2 pi divided by T of S. Okay, this is sampling time. So 2 pi divided by it is the sampling frequency. And then the Nanquist frequency equals to sampling frequency divided by 2 divided by 2. So it equals pi divided by T of S. And the result, uh, the theorem says, the Nankus frequency has to be larger than, it's, it's essentially saying this, the frequency of the sinusoidal has to be, the absolute value has to be smaller than the Nanquist frequency to make sure we can recover the signal. Okay, so, Let's take a look at this, take a moment to look at this result here. Suppose uh, I have sampling time is Ts. Then I have the period of this sinusoidal. Period of sinusoidal. It's gonna be two pi divided by omega. So this is in radians per second. No, this is in second. Omega is in radians per second. Okay? Huh? It's just a de defined by the sampling frequency divided by two. Mm. Mm. Oh, this is because in general, I can do sine, for example, 1t, and then I can do sine negative 1t. Right. Yeah, this is just because in the general case, uh, it can be negative, all right? So we're, we're here. We were talking about, essentially, I want to, I want to draw this picture. If I, have a sinu if I have a sinusoidal signal, its period, let's say, is 2 pi divided by omega. So this is the period of the sinusoidal. I want to discuss how many samples should I at least collect to recognize that this is sinusoidal at this frequency, okay? So the picture, uh, the result I want to use is over here. So suppose this Nanquist frequency, this sampling theorem holds, then I'm going to have uh, the period 2 pi divided by omega. So this guy, 2 pi divided by omega. For, for the general case, let me do this absolute value because of the logic I have just said. So uh, it makes sense. It makes much more sense to say have a positive period instead of negative period. So, period. so I'm going to use the absolute value. If the Shannon's sampling theorem holds, I'm going to have this guy, this period is going to be positive. Someone tell me larger than what? What number? from here, two times Ts, right? So it's saying, in, in the limiting case, I have to, the marginal case is this. This is Ts, this is Ts, okay? So it means in the sampling, I'm, uh, I'm sampling at this, ki this case. I'm at least getting these samples. The first sample here, the second sample here, because this is sampling frequency. So I'm at least getting these samples, okay? And the, the period of the, this, the, this sinusoidal cannot be, it has to be, uh, the period has to be larger than two times Ts. So let's see what will happen if smaller than. If, for example, the period is, uh, is this. If, if the period is Ts, let's see what will happen. It will look like, if so, can I borrow your red pen, the red one? Yeah. So if it's P Ts, you're going to see it's, it looks like this. Right? So you see, by taking these samples, I, I, cannot, I, I, I won't be able to know that I'm sampling this sinusoidal. Right? So in the same logic, if the period is, is even lesser than this, 
I won't be able to tell. I can't distinguish at all what sinusoidal frequencies I'm sampling at. Okay. However, if it's larger than that, no, let me use that. If the period is larger than Ts, now see what will happen. So let me draw another picture. These are the samples I'm sampling. So this is the case, I say, this is the marginal case we have to be able to achieve. Now, what, suppose I have sinusoidal, and the period of the sinusoidal is larger than this two times Ts. Then you think about it, you will, you will never be able to, if the period is, is let's say, four times Ts, Okay, so you immediately see it's impossible. If I'm sampling, if the sample data are here, if the sample data, if this is the axis, if I'm sampling these data, then it's impossible for the sinusoidal to be look like this. Okay, because its value is here. It's impossible for me to sample this sinusoidal to reach this data over here, okay? If it's a sinusoid, it has to be in this case, okay? So basically, uh, and, and you have seen that this sinusoidal here, the period has, cannot be smaller than this two times Ts. If it's in this case, then we, we are losing the sinusoidal signal. We, we can't know its frequency in this case. Okay, that's uh, the sampling theorem. Okay. Now, Let's talk about the discretization of a continuous time transfer function. So suppose we have designed a controller, a linear time invariant controller. The transfer function is GS. Then one way to digitalize this continuous time signal is to do, the, to do this, discretize the continuous time transfer function, okay? Is to substitute S equals two divided by TS, then over here, times z minus one divided by z plus one. So you see immediately, this is uh, the bilinear transformation, this equation here, okay? So the formula looks exactly like this. So substitute s with this guy, or equivalently, uh, z is related by s, to, related to s by this equation, okay? So this is the bilinear transformation. And uh, if you haven't seen it before, I just want to give you one quick, uh, one brief intuition of how this equation is arrived, okay? So we have talked about, in discrete time domain, z is a, s times ts, okay? So, uh, or we say, yeah, this is sufficient. So in discrete time systems, Z is related by this. And then if you do very simple algebra, this guy E equals to S T S divided by two. S T S divided by two, neg negative, okay? Just to break this exponential function into uh, two parts. And then here, take the Tyler expansion for the first part, for, 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 for both parts, okay? You're gonna get one plus S T S divided by two, and then plus higher order terms. And then on the bottom is one, divide, one minus S times T S divided by two, plus higher order terms. And the bilinear transformation, it's simply ignoring the higher order terms, and then use only the first order tile expansion here to do the approximation, okay? You see exactly, now z equals one, div one plus ts divided by two times s, okay? 
it sometimes, uh, as, you, as you learn more and more, sometimes it's confusing to remember these equations. But if you get the intuition here, uh, you can derive the bilinear transformation very easily. Okay? So looking at this bilinear transformation more detailedly, you see, what will the origin in the S-plane, so if this is the S-plane, what will this origin be mapped to in the discrete time Z-plane? If S equals to zero, Z has to equal to one. Okay? So what about infinity in the S domain? What will infinity be mapped to in the Z domain? Hmm? Yeah, if this is, if the bottom part becomes zero, okay? So the result is that this uh, imaginary axis in the S domain is going to be mapped to this unit circle. And this entire left half side of the S plane is going to be mapped to the inside of this unit circle. Okay? So the message here is that uh, if, the, if the continuous time transfer function is stable, then the discrete time, the discretization of this transfer function is also stable in the uh, Z domain. Okay? <clears throat> okay? So bilinear transformation, if you, if you use it in MATLAB, you will notice uh, when you do discretization. So in MATLAB, the discretization is this, C to D in MATLAB. Then you can put your transfer function here. And then you will put uh, the sampling time, uh, TS. And then uh, if you pay attention to, in MATLAB, you have a third option to say which method you're going to use. And uh, the binding. The bilinear transformation in MATLAB is called testing. The, the uh, command you use is testing over here. So this is because uh, bilinear transformation was uh, invented by a British mathematician called testing, okay, in the, in the period of World War I, I think, okay? All right. That's for the bilinear transformation for approximation of a, for discretization of a transfer function in continuous time domain. Let me ask a very quick question. What is another way to obtain a discrete time transfer function from a continuous time transfer function? Zero order hold. So in MATLAB, you can, the command you can also use in MATLAB. In MATLAB here, you can also put zero order hold here. The default option for MATLAB is uh, zero order hold. Huh? We'll talk about it very soon. Okay. I'm missing one page. <clears throat> so there's one thing very important to, to <coughs> keep in mind about the bilinear transformation. So one good thing is that uh, it, as I have explained, it maintains the stability. If in the continuous time domain, the transfer function is stable, then the discretization is also stable. That's actually very useful. But one thing you have to keep in mind is this guy. So you know as the bilinear transformation is this, Z minus one, Z plus one, okay? So you know, in continuous time domain, we evaluate S equal to J omega, all right? So what I'm gonna do now is from, from this equation, I want to uh, obtain, yes. I want to obtain something like this. 
So I want to see when I evaluate the discrete time frequency response. Okay, so this is how we evaluate discrete time frequency response by substituting j, uh, z equal to ej omega ts. I want to arrive at something similar here. Okay, this is, so in a sense, because of this analogy here, this is in a sense the equivalent frequency in the discrete time case. Okay, so in the end, I will be comparing the actual frequency and this, I can call it maybe a fictitious frequency in the discrete time case. Okay, so the detailed steps looks like this. I have, uh, I substitute z equal to ej omega ts to this bilinear transformation here. Then I'm gonna get a little bit algebra here. I'm gonna get two ts ej omega ts minus one, ej omega ts plus one. So this is a trick very common in uh, digital signal processing. So you take out, look at this guy. You can take out half of this exponential function. Let's see, ej omega ts divided by two. Then I'm gonna get inside ej omega ts divided by two minus e negative j omega ts divided by two. Divided by, so do the same thing on the bottom. So you're gonna get ej omega ts two plus e negative j ts divided by two. What does the bottom, what does uh, this guy equal to in the bracket? if you apply the uh, Euler equation. Uh, sine or cosine, or, so you, just to be a little bit more careful. So it's gonna be ej, yeah. So this guy is gonna cancel with this guy. And on the top part, I'm gonna have cosine omega ts plus j sine omega ts, okay? And then minus here, minus cosine j omega ts. Then I'm gonna have, a, because minus minus here, I'm gonna have plus j sine omega ts, okay? So it's not, you, you are right, but not perfectly correct because I have a j here. Sine omega ts divided by two. What about the bottom part? Cosine and then the two is gonna be canceled out. Okay, so this is the tangent of omega ts divided by two, okay? So this guy is gonna be the equivalent uh, frequency here. So the reason why I did this is this logic, consider this logic here, okay? So what is the actual frequency response for the system? Is this guy, gs with s equal to j omega. Now, what is the, if I do the discretization, what is the discrete time frequency response? It's gonna be equal to, for the, after discretization, I'm gonna evaluate gd z z equal to uh, ej omega ts. Okay, after this discretization, I'm doing this. Now, you, you know that gd of z is gs, and then by linear transformation, s equal to two divided by ts, z minus one, z plus one here. And then you take a z equal to ej omega ts here, okay? What I have, what we have just arrived is that this guy, s equal to this two divided by ts z minus one, substitute with j, z equal to ej omega ts equals this guy. So what we have arrived at is this guy is actually s equal to j omega v, 
Okay? Now you see one disadvantage for bilinear transformation is the discrete time frequency response, you are actually not evaluating the actual frequency response at omega frequency. You are evaluating at a different place, omega v. Okay? So let's take a look at how omega v and omega is related to. So this is essentially this equation here. What will be the case if omega is very small? If omega is very small, tangent is sine divided by cosine. If omega is small, then cosine is approximately one, and sine is approximately itself. So this approximately equals to omega times Ts divided by two. So if omega is very small, then we don't have much issues because this guy is gonna be approximately equal to omega v. What will be the case if omega is very big, let's say? How big? Uh, omega, someone help me here, figure out the number. How about somewhere near pi divided by two, then divided by Ts. So, somewhere near pi divided by Ts. How about this? If omega is approximately this, this, this frequency, what will be the tangent approximate? Infinity, right? So now you see here, if omega is very large, because sampling time is very small, so pi divided by sampling time is usually large. If omega is very large, you see this guy and this guy, they are not equal at all. So the case, I plotted here, the plot of omega versus omega v. You see, uh, when frequency is very small, omega is very small, no problem. We don't have much issues. But when omega is very large, then the uh, equivalent fictitious frequency in the discrete time domain will be not the same as the continuous time equation uh, frequency. So in practice, there's a way around to fix this issue, and this is discussed in this slide over here. Uh, the goal of this extended by linear transformation is to, I want to do something, uh, I want to do a little bit uh, manipulation such that when I evaluate the discrete time frequency response by doing z equal to ej omega ts, I'm gonna get exactly gs, the exact continuous time frequency response at frequency omega, okay? So this is a rough idea, but the truth is that uh, we cannot do this arbitrarily at any frequency. We can do it at a particular frequency, let's say omega p, okay? And the steps to do that is actually uh, not very difficult. So the step to do this is uh, you have seen s equal two divided by ts z minus one, z plus one. If I substitute z equal to ej omega ts equal to, let me write it again, two ts j tangent omega ts divided by two. Now, if I, if you look at this equation and consider this, I can do, I can, I can, Multi I can divide, I can divide. I can divide both sides by the tangent to get two Ts tangent omega Ts two. And then I multiply, maybe I have to, yeah, I'll, I'll keep on this at the moment. So I first divide both sides by uh, tangent then I'm gonna get hit this guy. Now, if I multiply omega on both sides, omega, omega, and then cancel this two Ts term. You see now, if I do this, 
then I can guarantee after I substitute, after I put some scaling ahead of this, I can guarantee I can reach this j equal to omega when I do z equal to ej omega ts. Okay, so the rough, the big picture is if I put some scalars ahead, then I will be able to guarantee this to hold. And the scalar, the scaling fact to be put is this guy. So it's this scalar which you have just seen. Here. Okay, so is that if you do this uh, extended bilinear transformation by using S equal to this scaled version of z minus one divided by z plus one, then you can achieve this. When you evaluate z equal to g j omega p t s, you can do uh, this is from this part is from here. This part, this tangent is from this guy, and this tangent is from here. They're gonna cancel. So the remaining is just gonna be exactly j omega. So in this way, we can have g s s equal to j omega at frequency p. So that's a very simple way to do extended, to arrive at this extended bilinear transformation. Okay. So uh, this this uh, extended bilinear transformation you can also realize in MATLAB. Uh, check the MATLAB command C to D. Okay, so I have explained that we can achieve the extended bilinear transformation at a particular frequency. Okay, so it's worthwhile to discuss how we choose this particular frequency. Okay, some obvious constraint we have to satisfy is uh, this omega p has to be below the Nanquist frequency, okay? And then some other, <coughs> some other very quick observation is that standard, by, standard linear transformation, uh, bilinear transformation, look at here. Standard bilinear transformation is the case omega p equal to zero, okay? So to see that, you simply take a look at uh, the value of p here, when omega p equal to zero. When omega p equal to zero, uh, this is gonna be two divided by ps. So you have to do the, uh, what's the name? Lo, I know the Chinese name, lo pita or when you, divide, when you divide zero by zero, you take the derivative of the top guy and the, take the derivative of the bottom guy. And then, the Lopita? Say that again? Lopita? Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to pronounce anyway, but you know what I'm talking about, all right? Lopitas, I, I would say. Okay, so you see, a standard bilinear transformation is just a particular case when omega p equal to zero, okay? The best choice of omega p is actually depend on your problem, the problem you are trying to do in practice, okay? So some examples are here. For example, uh, you can do it at the crossover frequency of the open loop frequency response, okay? You can do it here. In this way, you can obtain, you can maintain the crossover frequency of the open loop loop shape, okay? Okay, this is one choice. Another choice is sometimes the system has uh, resonances. Sometimes the system has resonance. This is very typical for a practical system. It has a resonance at some frequencies. And uh, practically what we do is to we introduce a notch filter. So notch filter shape to cancel this resonance. So in this way, it's very important that the center of this notch filter is gonna match the center of the resonance. So in that way, it's very meaningful to do a notch filter design uh, with uh, bilinear, extended bilinear transformation such that this frequency is obtained after discretization. Uh, let me see. 
I'll stop here today, and next lecture I'm going to talk about aliasing. That's something very interesting. Okay, I'll stop today here. <laughs>